Dog breeders have been able to breed many different breeds of dogs, showing the incredible range of genetic variation in a given species. But this is not evolution. All of these possible characteristics were already present in the DNA of ancient dogs, or were copying mistakes, like in the case of the pug-nosed dogs. The breeders simply selected the desired characteristics and excluded the undesired by selective breeding. But all the animals continue to be dogs. With time, the purebred dogs begin to lose the genetic information for the possibility of variation, just as the breeders wanted. But this is a loss of genetic information, not a gain. Even though many evolutionists call this microevolution, it is actually the opposite of evolution. Not only do purebred dogs end up with less genetic information and therefore less possibility of variation, they also end up genetically weakened against disease because of the accumulation of harmful mutations. The second intriguing fact about the lack of a mechanism is the truth about natural selection. It's true. Now wait a minute, natural selection is the fundamental idea of Darwinism, isn't it? How can you say that it's true? Are you saying that Darwin was right? Wasn't he the one who discovered and invented natural selection? Actually, the idea of natural selection was first described by a creationist zoologist by the name of Edward Blythe. In 1835 and again in 1837, the magazine, the British Magazine of Natural History, published articles on this subject by Blythe, 20 years before Darwin published his book. The truth is that Darwin received a copy of this magazine with Blythe's article during a stop in Peru during his five-year voyage on the HMS Beagle. In spite of using many of Blythe's words, Darwin never gave any credit to Blythe for his ideas. Natural selection is what actually happens in the real world. In a specific species, the stronger animals have better chances of survival, and therefore reproduction, than weak ones. In a group of tigers in a given area, it's obvious that the fastest and strongest will have a much better chance of having descendants than a crippled or blind tiger. So the idea is that the stronger animal is favored naturally to survive and reproduce. This is true. This is essentially the same principle used by dog breeders or by farmers in selecting desired characteristics for their crops. Except that one happens naturally and the other by intelligent choice. But both selective breeding and natural selection have one thing in common. Both have to do with eliminating genetic options, not with creating something new. The principle of natural selection is the reality of the real world and in no way goes against what the Bible teaches. Stephen Jay Gould wrote, The essence of Darwinism lies in a single phrase. Natural selection is the creative force of evolutionary change. No one denies that natural selection will play a negative role in eliminating the unfit. Darwinian theories require that it create the fit as well. Another evolutionist, Roger Lewin, has a much more credible take on this subject. Natural selection, as the central characteristic of neo-Darwinism, can have a stabilizing effect, but does not provide the creation of new species. It is not the creative force that many have suggested. The problem for evolutionists is that natural selection certainly is not a mechanism of evolutionary change. It can favor positive changes that happen by genetic variation, but never produces those changes. Natural selection eliminates deficient organisms but never generates new species.
the first really big scientific problem with evolution is the lack of a mechanism. So we see the reality of genetic variation and the truth of natural selection. But the third fact is the dilemma for genetic evolution. If genetic variation exists, and it does, and if natural selection is real but isn't the mechanism for evolution, which it certainly isn't, then what is the mechanism that supposedly makes evolution happen? The truth is that evolutionists during the last 200 years have advanced various theories. The first was the idea of the naturalist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck that Darwin accepted and believed, the idea of acquired characteristics. Lamarck believed that new characteristics acquired by the effort of the organism would be then inherited by the offspring of that organism. His classic example was based on the long neck of the giraffe. Lamarck theorized that the giraffe evolved his long neck over a series of generations. He imagined that during a drought the lower leaves on the trees would all be eaten, leaving the necessity of stretching one's neck to reach the higher leaves that remained. He taught that by means of physical effort, the animal who succeeded in stretching to reach those higher leaves would pass on that ability and even a longer neck to his offspring. Unfortunately for Darwin and Lamarck, scientists now know that it doesn't work like that. Imagine for a moment a couple that loves to lift weights. They fall in love and get married. Then their first son is born and... Whoa! The truth is that body changes acquired by mental or physical effort are not inherited by descendants. Scientists today reject Lamarck's idea as one more example of science fiction. But this is the idea that Darwin believed when he wrote his book. It's fascinating to see how many times the foundation of evolution was laid on erroneous science like this. So we see that the idea of Lamarck, acquired characteristics, is no longer considered as a possible mechanism for evolution, because these changes to an organism are not passed on to its descendants.